Good morning, afternoon, and evening to all of you who have joined us. My name is Jonathan Kang with Cloudian, and I'll be your host for the webinar today. I see a few folks who are still logging into the audio, so let's give them another minute. All right. Thank you to all who have joined us as we have an exciting program in the next 30 to 45 minutes. I want to welcome all of you to our webinar today on how Montebello uses video surveillance and analytics to save costs and increase safety. Joining us today are John Tour, CMO at Cloudian, David Twin, Systems Manager at the City of Montebello, and Bill French, Analytics Officer at Streamit. For today's webinar, Please do feel free to ask questions at any time in the chat window, and we'll make sure our presenters will have a chance to answer them near the end of the session during Q&A. And with that, let's get started. So I'll let John take it from here. John? Hey, thank you very much, Johnson, and uh, thank you all for joining. And I think we've got a really exciting program today talking about an interesting project that uh, Claudian and Streamit worked on with the City of Montebello. And joining us from the City of Montebello today, we have David who worked on this really from the beginning and was very much the visionary in terms of putting this project together. So uh, really, really thrilled to have David with us today to talk about this. And I'm just going to start off by asking you, David, um, so tell us a little bit about you know, the Montebello bus lines. Hey, uh, John, thanks for the introduction. Um, so Montebello Bus Lines was established in uh, 1910. Uh, we actually transport um, around um, 80, uh, 8 million passengers annually. And our current fleet size is about 72 buses with uh, additional support vehicles. Uh, the city itself is located about 10 miles west of downtown Los Angeles. So you can imagine that we actually have 8 million um, passengers, um, uh, how important it is for us to actually uh, um, have something that is uh, going to protect the riders, uh, riders um, in terms of um, safety and security. Yeah, exactly. I mean, ridership safety is, of course, the whole, the whole point of this, and that's really what video surveillance system is there for. So, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the previous system you were using and some of the challenges you had with that. Okay, well, we, we, we actually have multiple old systems, right? We were a, a mix of, um, of one company to, you know, to another company. It's just mix and match of, of old uh, analog systems, right? So, you know, with that, we have a lot of challenges. And one of our, our main challenges is to retrieve videos. Uh, we know that the old system can't provide anything real time. Um, uh, so, so being able to retrieve video was very important to us, right? Uh, the way it works right now, um, not right now, but like, and the old way was that if, if this an incident, um, a report comes into our, our officers, and the officers then have to actually manually uh, go through the process of finding the video, which is really, really time consuming. Um, that kind of, um, um, in the world of security, time is, very, is an essence, right? And then when they find the video, they actually have to offload the video. And usually, um, the video takes one hour to, uh, to offload for one hour of video. Uh, which is, you know, an additional uh, time constraint. Um, because we didn't have any centralized uh, storage video um, storage, so if there's an incident on a bus, the security personnel would actually have to go to that bus to, ex to extract the video. And oftentimes, we actually have to um, bring the, bath, the bus back into the depot, to our station, in order for that to happen. So, so what in, in, in essence, we're actually uh, reducing uh, service time uh, to a residence because we have to hold a bus and to just grab videos. And then we actually have a lot of officers who come in and ask for videos because our bus have you know videos facing out towards the street. So when they come in and ask for video, it was it was very difficult to search because there was very little information uh, in the incidents, right? And once even if you find find that out, um, there there's the way to to move videos from um, the, uh, the transit to an officer also requires some time that involves sometimes DVD burning, um, uploading, which takes a long time because they're, they're very, very big files. And, and then another challenge was storage retentions because we didn't have a central storage. Um, each bus would store videos uh, on its own, um, what they call NVR. Um, so, and, and the, the videos are kind of off sync. So if if an officer comes in, I want all the videos for that one day from all the bus, you may not get all the videos from all the buses because 
some might have been poor, who was all written. So we, we don't have consistency uh, from that. And then as a whole, this, this system um, that we had previously was called was reactive, meaning that um, if something happens, we go out and pull video. Well, that doesn't really help um, the victims, right? Let's say, for example, if somebody got stabbed, that person died already, and now we're going to go get videos. It really serves no purpose for the victims. So we needed to change that mentality. We need to actually uh, get involved with the situation right away before it escalates to something very serious. Yeah, so this is, this is something that's at a very real time in your, in your life. So I think in some, some places you think of video surveillance as, as a recorded thing, but this is, this is very real time for you. So let, let's talk a little bit about some of the objectives of, of what you're really trying to do with the video surveillance system. So our, our main objective was to provide safety and security um, for our passengers. Um, um, and because our bus actually travels not just you know, within Montebello, it actually travels to multiple different cities uh, across city lines as well too. So um, safety and, and, and their security is very, very important to us, right? Um, so what we want was we want live video. Not only video, but we also want live data. So what I mean by that is you're looking at the video, then you're, you're gathering information about bus speed, the next nearest bus stops, and the bus giving the exact address location rather than than GPS um, coordinates. So why is that important? Is this a situation if the uh, if the dispatcher have to radio into the officers, they would just give the street the corner street. There they are, because because the officers um, usually are very familiar with the street areas in Montebello. So that's very important for us, right? So data. That's what I mean by data. Data is very important for us, and we want to improve search also using um, uh, using data and video. So what that means is that if, for example, if we say, well, this bus overspeed on this day, find me that information. When did the bus overspeed? And show me the videos correlated to it. And then we also want to improve the, the, the retrieval process, too. Um, in the old, old, old previous, previous way, we would actually have to you know, uh, extract the video, um, export. And export does take a long time, too, because it transcodes as, ex, as it's exporting and then burn it to DVDs. Um, so we were thinking about this process, and that's, that's too long. We need to get the videos to the office as soon as possible. Uh, we want to improve storage retention, local, one single storage retention, so that all the videos are consistent. So we want a video for this day. This is the video for, um, for this day throughout all the buses. So that's very important to us. And we want to um, we want to have some analytics to to the system as well too. Now analytics both in data and videos. What I mean by that is they're using data correlation, and then video in, in video for object recognitions um, uh, and, and and identification. So that's what we mean by an, analytics. So we wanted that, and we thought that was important. And in case an example, if our video can can understand that is that there's a bike on the on the bike rack in front of the bus, we would know well. Okay, there's a bike, or there's no bike rack. So that's important to our riders too. We want to be able to notify the riders. Hey, you know what? You have a bike. Look at this bus. You have space to put your bike in. So that's kind of important to us. So from the analysis and analytics, what we wanted to do is we want to create some some sort of safety uh, uh, protocol for the system. And for example, um, the new buses that we have with this new system all have access control. What that does is when a driver goes into to the bus and wants to start the bus, they actually have to present their credentials by swiping a reader. When the reader is approved, then they can start the bus. So that's what we mean by, uh, by actions, right? And then also, when that happens, it actually captures the picture of, of the driver to swipe, the, bus, uh, swipe the, the, the readers. So to verify that that car is, in fact, belongs to the drivers. Because oftentimes, you lose a key or you lose a card, um, anyone can actually just swipe it, right? So we need some sort of uh, uh, analytics and, uh, and correlations uh, for us. And then what's really important as a whole is that, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, but data is what tells the story. And often the story, uh, often we need the data and the view to help us reconstruct an incident for safety, for personnel, and for the court. Because safety and security is all about telling a story, right? So that's why it's important to have data and video together. 
Um, one example is if you're looking at a video of a person falling down, you can assume that you know the bus is traveling really fast, decelerated rapidly, and caused the person to fall down. Well, you have data that says, hey, there was zero speed at that time. There was no de rapid deceleration. Then you can say for a fact that the bus did not move. The person might have fall on it on their own or got tripped or something, right? So data supports the video. Right. So you you have a need for data and video to be collected at the same time, the same place, and be cross correlated. And you're doing all this in a in a in a mobile platform, which I think is you know what really ups the ante in terms of making the solution you know, the, the project very challenging. So let, let's talk about some of the challenges you had in in, in implementing this solution. So just like you know, just like any other um, um, video surveillance out there, we actually took cameras from uh, uh, from our building. Uh, we actually had some new cameras uh, from Mobotics um, installed in our building. We took the camera, installed it on the bus, and see you know see how it works. And you know we were getting great pictures and everything, but then again, as we move forward, we were hitting some challenges. And one of the biggest challenges was communication. Uh, we actually we, we have cellular and Wi-Fi, right? So, so if you know anything about cellular, it's very, very unstable uh, in areas where there's no coverage, you have no communication. In areas where there is a lot of coverage, you have high communication. The rate varies a lot, right? And that's really important for us. If you're transmitting video, live video, you, you want the data to be consistent, right? But in our case, it wasn't. So we came up with an idea as well. We need to build the video, live video, live streaming on the lowest data that is available, which is 3G. So our videos, our system is made to work on 3G, because then after that, 5G, 4, you know, 6G is, is really nothing, right? So, so that's, that's, that's what we need to do. When we try to transfer large files uh, over mobile and Wi-Fi, it was a, a huge challenge. Um, uh, it, it took forever, and it never completed. Um, so the, that was a really headache to us, and it took us many years approximately three years to figure out what, what Wi-Fi works, uh, what transfer protocol works, and how to do it efficiently. Um, and then the other thing was um, we actually had just traditional storage, which is based on block storage. Block storage is, is, is you're familiar with um, file share. That's what block storage is. Um, block storage isn't very efficient for transferring videos when the communication isn't consistent. And then we also have the challenge of scaling the storage. Um, it's very, very difficult. We've actually tried it and fill up our server, our storage server, and we're like, well, how do we expand it without, you know, losing the video or that the system recognizes the expansion of the storage? So it was very, very difficult for us. So if we can't expand, then we can't retain the videos to the length that we want it, right? And the other, the other. Um, um, Challenges were the bus environment. If, if you know anything about the bus, it's constantly moving. Uh, there's constantly electrical problem. Um, it's just, the power will just go on and off. And the system will ha has to be able to to um, accept this abuse. And the heating is always an issue issue too, because the equipment is stored in a cabinet. Um, sometimes the heat can go over 100 degrees, so heating was, was an issue. And then vibration. The bus is constantly constantly moving. Um, it's moving to, uh, uh, through streets that have potholes, bumps, vibration. It would destroy the system. Now, the funny thing is it doesn't destroy just the, uh, the recorder. It also destroys the camera. So if you pick a camera that has optical, um, optical focus, it will, the vibration will destroy it and it will not work. So the camera uh, was very important too. We need something that has no moving parts at all to eliminate the possibility of vibrations and killing it. And then we need a software to tie them all. Um, the software that we need it needs to be built on web technology. What that means is that from the ground up, it needs to be web-based um, for, for, um, for streaming into different devices. And we want it to be open architecture and open standard. And the reason why we wanted that is that we want to be able to incorporate IOTs. And IOTs are, are um, our sensors, that we're thinking about sensors that we can put on the bus, or even information from the bus diagnostic itself to be able to extract that in and process the information. 
So now if we collect more data with the video, we actually have a much more complete story to tell. Um, and then the system needs to be able to ha have data and video analytics. Uh, that's very important because um, the, the, the analytics is going to tell us what's happening on the bus without us sitting on, on the video monitor all the time. You know, there's, there's a bunch of systems out there that, that would sell you monitors, 20 monitors that you can see, what they call video walls. Well, what we're thinking was, no, no one will have the to sit down and watch 20 monitors and pick out what's happening. It doesn't work that way. So we need analytics to help us notify us that there's, there's a possible situation. Um, let us know, notify us. So this way, the, the security personnel isn't tied down to their desk. Right. So you got a lot of challenges here in terms of how you're communicating, how you're storing the data, you know, the environment you're working in, and then you know, analyzing the information you're getting. And obviously, you've got you know gigabytes of information coming in every day. So um, let's talk about the, the the new solution, the new system, and how you solve those problems. Right. So you know, with the help of Streamit and Cloudian, um, we now actually have real-time video and data continuously. So that means when all we need to do is just log in, we have everything visible to us. And then we actually have a centralized scalable storage um, that Let's is cost that effective continuous. now. Let's talk about that one but, point first. On the, on the, on the uh, continuous access to video and operational, how, how, you know, what was the technology that allowed you to make that you know, transfer of information from the bus uh, to the central facilities you know, seamless? Well, the one thing is that you know the the entire software was based on web technology to allow us um, to access on any devices, and then behind that is, is is the transfer of video. It's more efficiently now using the uh, the S3 protocol. So what that does is that um, it, it takes files, um, you know, one file, and it chops it up into multiple parts and transfers it. So what what happens is that if the, the, if you lose connection during the transfer, it doesn't require the entire file to be transferred again, uh, like FTP, RSync, or SMB. If you lose connection, you would have to start the transfer all over again. But with S3, um, if you lose connection, it only transfers the parts that it needs to make the, uh, the entire file whole. So that's, that was more efficient for us. It was m more susceptible to um, uh, network connection problems. Right, so the S3 API is the same language that uh, you know Amazon uses for their S3 storage. So it was it's basically an API designed for moving data over the internet. So that same API, you're, you're not using S3 storage you know, per se in Amazon, but the S3 API, that that language, is what allowed you to move the data from the bus to the terminal in a in a seamless way. Correct, and and that that S3 is what makes video transfer uh, possible over you know cellular or Wi-Fi. So you know the central storage, um, our, our new sensor, the central storage uh, is, is you know as I was saying it's scalable and it's cost effective. So what we mean by cost effective is this. So we actually have a very big storage system that's for the bus. But we wanted the the storage to actually have multi-tenancy. What, what that means is if in the future the police comes to me and say, hey, you know what, I have videos from my police car. I want to store somewhere. And, we'll, and without spending a lot of money, so sure, we can. We can actually carve a section of, of that storage and say, police, this is your storage, your partition. And then if fire says, you know, I want video recorded on, on my rigs as well, so sure, now we can actually carve that out, um, a carve a section of the, of the storage out for the fire department without having to go buy a new system a new storage system. So that to us is very, very cost effective. And then the operation data um, is stored and correlated with the video. What we mean by operational data is, is the speed of the bus, where it's located at, um, who actually um, swiped the card, um, what time the bus is coming in, what time the bus is pulling out. All this information are now stored in metadata and it's correlated with the video. What then that, that, that makes searching um, for the video and the data much more efficiently, much much more quicker. Right. And so the underlying technology that gave you that was the object storage, right? The, the object storage system is what gave you that scalability and that metadata recording in the same place at the same time possible. Correct. 
So with that in, in, in mind, it, it improves search by by factors. Um, just just for example, um, you know, there, we actually have over five million video clips. To search over five million video clips on a traditional box storage would take you hours, if not days. Uh, with what we have right now, it's just seconds. It pops up. Half the videos that we so that, want. Right, that's that elastic search component. So it gives you a, a Google-like search capability across that object storage system. Right, Google web-based search capability. Um, so, so then, you know, with, with this in place, with the new system in place, we, we're actually are incorporating and putting more safety features onto the bus. Um, safety features, as in, um, you know, the, the cart readers being able to uh, monitor uh, our rear, rear door for um, passengers that's hovering around the rear door before the bus takes off. Uh, and that's actually very important because sometimes you, you, you get off in the rear door, you drop something, the bus drivers do not see anybody bending down to pick up anything on that rear door. So if they don't see it, they don't know what, that there's a person there, they can just take off and perhaps run that people, um, the person over. And I wouldn't say perhaps, um, it's already happened a lot. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a news in New York and that happened. So, so having this safety mechanism really, really helps us a lot and we really reduce a lot of risk. Um, and then one more thing is that the new system has real-time system analytics, um, a system diagnostics. What that means is that, fine, we have the new system, but we need to be able to know what's going on with that system, what's failing, what's working, what's not working. You know, a, a lot of systems forget about that, forget about diagnosing itself. Well, we can't have that. We have such a small staff that we need the system to tell us what's going on with the system itself. So real-time system diagnostic is, is very important to us. Okay. And then finally, you've got to have, obviously, a, a, the video management system to tie it all together. Great. So I think that's a really interesting summary, David. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating technology where you combine some really, um, you know, like I said, web-based technologies. I mean, S3 is the storage API that was born on the internet, so it's it's ideal for what you're doing. And then uh, you know, the object storage system, another web-based technology that you're using in your data center uh, to uh, store that data, so it remains on-prem, easily searchable, and quickly accessible to your crew. And then finally, you know, the, the VMS, the software, you know, the magic that ties it all together. Um, and here to talk about that part of it is um, Bill French from Streamit, who's going to take you through a little bit about that part of the solution. Thanks. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. Um, you know, why Streamit? Uh, it's a good question. We certainly understand the importance of real-time video. Um, we know video and data analytics. And we are using AI to predict and make analyses that are, you know, important in the future. Um, you know, Dave could not have underscored the challenges better, uh, you know, in his, in his art articulation of how we use this video uh, information. It's important to realize, of course, that, you know, trying to blend video and, uh, and data together requires real-time performance. Uh, the video is recording, of course, in real time. It's live. And the data that we're extracting from that video also needs to be at the same speed. And of course, to achieve that requires a tremendous amount of architecture under the covers in order to facilitate the movement of data from uh, these moving vehicles, uh, which are very challenging climates to begin with, over to the systems uh, that we uh, then use for the data. So uh, that, you know, that's, that pretty much sums it up. Why stream it? We understand the, uh, the climate and we understand the objective. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And I think, you know, from the cloudian part of the solution, you know, obviously the, what David really emphasized was, you know, he needed to have, you know, the, the, the cloud technology, the web-based technology, the full S3 compliance. And then, uh, you know, the, the fact that you have this uh, object storage environment that is searchable is another key part of this whole solution because without the ability to find the information in real time and pull it up when required by law enforcement or whoever, uh, it, it loses its effectiveness. The, real, the timeliness of the solution is very important. 
Uh, the cost effectiveness, you know, this is cloud-based technology, but it's built on industry standard hardware that sits in your data center. So it's very, very cost effective. And what that really matters is for retention, right? If you're going to retain data for a long period of time, uh, that retention has to be affordable. It has to fit within your operational budget. And uh, you're not going to be able to achieve that with traditional storage technologies that often cost three times as much money. And then finally, you know, the, this, is, this is scalable, right? The, the solution will grow with the requirements. Uh, and, and it's modular, meaning that as the requirements grow, you simply add on new modules that add capacity. So there's no downtime. There's no interruption of service. Uh, there's no need for scheduling a maintenance call. It's just uh, something that happens organically as the requirements grow. And it also grows all within a single storage environment. So yeah, I think uh, between the technologies of, of Streamit and, and Cloudy, and it provides the underpinning of this whole, you know, uh, this whole solution. So, David, with that, I mean, let's let's talk a little bit about, you know, you know what you've been through and uh, what you've learned from this, and what advice you would give to others that are going off and doing this same kind of solution today. Well, thanks, Tom. Um I, I think understanding the the overall needs is very important, right? current and feature objectives. So don't be focused on saying, hey, I want the video. Well, think about what you want to do with the video. Did you want to just see something, or did you want to be able to tell a story of what you see? That's very important, right? And, and as, as I've talked about before, the system was designed, for, um, designed based on open architecture and open standard. What that means is that um, you can actually start small and expand later. You don't have to invest in a huge amount of money to just get the complete system. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be that way. We've designed it. We've proved that it can start small and expand. And then because it's, it's based on open architecture and open standards, the system is future-proof, meaning that any new system that's out in the market, this system can actually communicate and talk with it, right? IoT ready, right? And the other thing that to, to watch out for is do not mix old and new technology. It's very important. So, you have a new technology, um, just like if you were to buy, like say, a, 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 um, a supersonic jet, and then you add a propeller to it. It can't defeat the purpose. So don't do that. I, I would say do not mix analog system with the new digital system. It, it's just not going to work right. So that's something to watch out for. Yeah, I think I think a natural tendency for people when they're doing their project is to you know try to reuse as much as you can of the existing uh, technology. And I think what you're saying is be very wary because they may not you know, play well together, and you may be compromising the overall solution by by trying to do that. Right. That's correct, John. That that's very very important, and it also makes the makes the new system feel old because you actually have old components on there. Right. Yeah, and I think yeah, you, 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 you innovated. You innovated by having an end-to-end -end approach towards this whole this whole package, and it wasn't something where you just uh, you know plugged in a better solution at one point. You you looked at an end-to-end -end approach. Um, Stream it obviously played a, a huge role in in integrating that end-to-end -end approach. Um, so so Bill, tell us a little bit about uh, Stream it as a as a company and what what value you bring to the picture here. Yeah, so you know, um, it's a great conversation because uh, I have to say, you know, right from the get-go, that um, the challenges that Montebello has put in front of us, and you know, the team at Montebello, these guys are working endless hours. Dave specifically, uh, Vo as well, and they're trying to make sure that we get the harshest, most difficult uh, problems to solve possible. And, and they've done a great job at that. They've really put a lot of good hills to climb in front of us. And we, we laugh about it a lot. Um, you know, some, some days we cry about it. But at the end of the day, um, you know, my, my hat goes off to this organization because you don't typically find uh, an open-thinking, forward-thinking, visionary like Dave in government. Uh, it's, it's simply not something that you see often. And so we've had this wonderful opportunity. So I just want to take a moment to thank them, you know, for allowing us to participate and get really, really dirty in this mud. 
And uh, when I say that, I, I say that you know with, with great pleasure because when I when I looked at this problem domain, you know, about a year and a half ago with Lance King, I discovered that you know real time video always existed. I mean that you can't do video without real time. But what was really lacking was was real time data. And Dave saw that vision. Lance saw that vision. We all put our heads together. And so why did we actually go down the real time road? you know, in a serious way. And, and I think the simple answer is that real-time analytics gives you this increased capacity to act. It shortens the time that you are ignorant, right? See, so you, you're ignorant about a lot of business activities on a day-to-day -day basis, operational activities. You don't know what you don't know. And real-time analytics give you that information very, very quickly so that you have an increased capacity to act. Because in an hour, the fact that somebody's fallen on a bus is going to have less value than it does at the moment that they fall or the moment somebody is injured or the moment um, some sort of violence uh, breaks out. Uh, you know, two years from now, that data is zero value. But at the moment that it happens, it has great value. So we really regard the uh, analytics as a key thing. Now, when we came into this, of course, you know, it, it really is a storm of problematic issues. The bus is always moving, it's shaking, it's changing direction, it's changing altitude, it's moving from dry climate into wet climate, it's cold sometimes, it's hot other times, it's often dark in a bus, it's often hot, sometimes it's, it's cold, but there's always reflection and there's always noisy conditions. So take that and then add to the fact that your communication uh, separation from high-speed networks is always an issue, as Dave pointed out earlier. And you have, you know, a recipe for a very difficult compute climate. But we rose to that challenge, and we began to think about the two worlds of, you know, Internet of Things and Internet of Recognition. And I think we're probably the first company that has really separated those concepts and said, look, a camera Yes, it's an IoT device, but it's a special kind of IoT device. It's the kind that can recognize many different things, whereas opposed to a temperature sensor, it has one job. It has a, it's an IP address-based device, connects to the network, you install it, it does its own job. But a camera can do hundreds, potentially thousands of jobs. And that's why we separate those two worlds, and we really use them to conspire with one another so that we can get data about things that are in the IoT class as well as things that are in the AI or video representation class. And by doing that, that gives us four new worlds of promise in transit. One is real-time access, having the ability to click a single button and begin to see and evaluate exactly what's going on in a real-time way out on the street. So it gives that, that dispatch center and those managers and law enforcement a much greater tactical ability to see and experience what might be happening in a, in a vehicle or public transit environment. And then you take that to real-time search. Uh, the video that you see there, the image in that uh, snapshot, is video that's literally been searched before the video has made its way to the Cloudian store. So we have literally bridged the, the span between data at rest and data in the field. So this data is still in the field. The video content is still in a little green dot there on the map, and we're able to incorporate it into search seamlessly. That's a very powerful possibility that arises when you bring in real time. And then uh, a third item is real-time events, the ability to lay out, well, how did time unfold? When did somebody actually take possession of the bus? When did it leave our yard? Things like that. All of those real-time events really matter to the, uh, to the folks at Montebello. And then lastly, the ability to get real-time visibility into the analytics that are occurring as they are happening. So you can know before a bus arrives uh, at the next stop, how many people are on it, and based on your data and your historical data, you can predict how many people are probably going to get off at that stop. 
And that's done through a, a number of different methodologies that we use at Streamit. Uh, and so lastly, I just wanted to point this out. Um, it's been said by the Federal Transit uh, Administration that they believe that most of the transit organizations in America are running on legacy surveillance technologies, legacy video systems. As Dave pointed out, he was very clear about the analog uh, you know, systems and some of the old world technologies that have been applied from a security sense into the stream and environment. Uh, FTA has been very blunt about this. They're saying it's time to change. You gotta move on. And so with that, I'll pass that back to you guys. One last comment, there is a very deep dive that I did on this exact topic, uh, also in Bright Cloud. If you just search for Real Time Summit, you will see a very deep dive that includes many of the topics that I touched on just now in the last six minutes. Terrific, all right, thank you very much, Bill. And just to just to wrap it up on you know, a little a few words about Cloudian, and we are you know a high, Cloudian is a storage system. So although the name is somewhat uh, somewhat deceptive, having the word cloud in it, this is on-prem storage in in your data center. In the case of I, you know, Montebello, it's in a it's in a data center within the Montebello facility and uh, you know, running right co-located with all the video management software that Bill was just talking about. And really, what, why this why this matters in this kind of situation is the existence of these technologies. One of them is the S3 API, and you, you cannot underestimate the importance of the communication protocol in making a video surveillance system like this possible. You know, without the ability to move data seamlessly between the mobile platform and the stationary platform in the data center, nothing else would be possible. And you know, the S3 API is the only storage protocol that was born in the age of the internet. All the other protocols you know, predated the internet and were not really designed for movement over WANs. Uh, S3 was. It's, it's the same protocol that makes you know, your Netflix streaming at home possible. So that was an extremely important part of it. The other piece of this is that it's object storage. And that means that it scales to meet the you know, growing needs that David's going to have over you know, the coming years. He's going to continue to uh, accumulate data, and object storage just organically grows to accommodate that. And no other type of storage system does that. And these are really the key things that, that make it, from a technology perspective, useful. And then from a cost perspective, it's all built on industry standard hardware. Uh, we ship appliances as a product, but the appliances are built on uh, commodity type servers, which are you know, the most cost effective storage medium there is. It's the same type of storage that's used in the internet. So you are again leveraging you know, a, a cloud-like technology in, in your own data center. Uh, you know, it's, it's, when technology revolutions like this come along, it enables new things. And you know, I think I hats off to David for having the vision to you know in, 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 to see what's possible to begin with, and to build and stream it for tying it all together. But uh, yeah, I think it's a great example of how we can enable new things with new technologies. So with that, let's go ahead and uh, dive into some questions here. All right, great. Thank you, guys. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Uh, we have a couple questions, um, so let's get right into it. The first one is, why use object storage for video surveillance as opposed to NAS? Yeah, I think, I think this is a very interesting question because uh, traditional video surveillance systems have used a different storage technology called network, network attached storage. And if you go back 10 years, that, that kind of was the scalable storage medium of choice, and it was e easy to use and, and, and relatively easy to grow. The challenge is that it hasn't kept up. NAS technology doesn't accommodate the needs of a really scalable platform where you're collecting information with you know, 1080 cameras, for example, at 30 frames per second. Uh, you know, the, the scale of those solutions just doesn't match up. They also cost significantly more, about three times as much, so there, there's that as well. But finally, for, for David's solution in particular, I think the real uh, impediment was the need for, you know, that S3 API. He had to have that protocol to make the, the data movement over the Internet seamless, reliable, 
uh, something he can count on in real time. So that, that combination, the S3 API, the scale, and the cost are really what set this apart from uh, network attached storage. Uh, uh, I can add to that, um, John, if, if, if I may, because we did try to use a traditional NAS storage or, um, uh, or a SAS storage. Um, the, the, the problem was that it, it, it doesn't have the ability to be able to, to receive files from multiple nodes. It's great for if you're actually on, 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 a, uh, on a network where a uh, network is, is consistent, the bandwidth is good, and there's no interruption, it's great. But when it comes to a network where it's very unpredictable, network drops, uh, bandwidth dec uh, deduction on a rapid uh, uh, scenario, what that does is that the phone never gets transferred. It never completes transferring. So our, our, our buses were always behind on transferring video, up to two weeks behind. That, to us, is very unacceptable. The, the only light time that we should have in an environment like this is when it's out on the field, one day at max light time. Yeah, that's a huge, huge goal, absolutely. Great, thank you. Uh, the next one is, is the real data, real-time data stored with the video content, like video metadata? Uh, you want me to take that? Yes, Bill. Yeah, I think that's yeah. yeah. Yep, so um, real-time data uh, flows in through what we call our slipstream uh, layer, which is kind of the glue between vehicles, our, our, our appliances, our stream of appliances, and the data store. And when I say the data store, the data store is big, right? And it involves many different um, uh, types of data as well. And of course, the we often refer to it as metadata that is coming along based on the video. The video is the video data, goes to Cloudian. But all of our metadata goes directly into Elasticsearch. And the reason for that is because that gives us a far better uh, search performance um, that we could get if we tied all of the metadata to the video artifacts. And if you think about it, it gets a little bit complex. Imagine that you had, uh, you know, you had noticed um, somebody who is uh, exhibiting deceptive behavior in two different video segments that are adjoining each other, and you wanted to tag that video with a complete history of that person's uh, deceptive behavior, say at a bus stop, uh, you would have to tag or duplicate tag two different video segments. And that's not the way to do it. So architecturally, we optimize tagging as it relates to video artifacts, so we keep that in elastic. Great, thank you. Uh, the next one is, what use cases make sense to keep on-prem versus move to the cloud? Uh, you want to take that, Dave? Um, yeah, I'll take that. So, what we, we on-prem was allow us to transfer video over Wi-Fi in larger volumes, right? So that's why we needed the cloud to be on-prem versus just pure Amazon, right? Because if you imagine just to transfer, you know, data over LT, it would just take forever because of the inconsistent um, upload. Um, so, when we have on-prem, we can actually access the video much quicker. Now, for a certain amount of period of time, like over six months or two a year, so those data become old. Now, we, have, we actually have an option to actually offload that to a cloud storage where we don't need it, but it's there when we need it to. So cloud actually offers us that because it is 100% um, uh, Amazon compatible with its S3. So whatever cloud that we decide to go with, um, we can actually um, offload and archive the videos. Um, but what we have on-prem is the videos that we need right away, that we need to get right away um, without any delays. Yeah, what makes the cloud storage technology interesting is you have the ability to choose either, and you can use the same API for either cloud or on-prem. But as David said, you know, for cost, security, performance, uh, there's a lot of good reasons for keeping data on-prem. The beauty is with this solution, you have the option of taking it either way, uh, depending on your use case. And that's the same Great, with extreme solution as well. Um, it, it really doesn't matter to us. We work in both environments. There are many advantages to both. 
and uh, it's on a case-by-case -case basis, I think, is the best way to approach it. All right, thank you. So I think, John, this one's more for you. It says, how does video data become searchable in Cloudium? Well, I think, uh, so from our standpoint, at Cloudium, the, the video data is recorded along with metadata. So the data about the data, which is generated through uh, you know, stream of software, through the input that's coming in through David's operators. Uh, the metadata is generated, and I think David can give us a few examples of what that metadata would be, but it's stored, co-located with the object. And then uh, the, uh, the elastic search then searches you know, that you know, object database for that metadata, identifies where that exists, and then pulls up the appropriate object. And I think, David, this would be a great, you know, great example where you could you know, toss in, you know, what are a few examples of the kind of metadata you're storing? Uh, well, for one thing, since, since the, the vehicles are moving, uh, GPS coordinates is very important to us, right? G GPS location. And then um, there was an, actually a need to know how fast the bus is moving. Now, it's also not just knowing how fast, but how fast it is relative to the speed limit. If the speed limit says 45 and the bus is going 50, 55, 60, there's a problem. We need to know right away why that bus is going so fast. So those kind of data is really important to us. And also acceleration, deceleration, because that actually, um, when, when the bus decelerates really quickly, that often you know, creates a situation where people fall, fall off the seat, or fall to the floor when they're, when they're up. So those data are very important to us. And, in, and as we move and progress further, um, provided that you know, the, the, the bus um, manufacturer allow us to, to tap into the bus, um, what, what they call an onboard diagnostic, and grab information. So now we'll, all, we'll also know like, how, how, much the fuel, how much fuel the bus has, uh, what's the brake level, um, and all these situations that can say, hey, you know what, the, the bus actually have low brake fluid. Probably you don't want to send that bus out there because it could cause some problems. So, so data is, is very, very important for us. Data, data and video coupled together is, is very important to us. I could also add to this, um, this is a really interesting topic to us at StreamIt, because we see video as metadata. <laughs> so I'm going to turn the entire world on its head right now and say that, that the metadata about a given event is actually potentially video artifacts. So if you have an AI process that has noticed some sort of violent event or a rapid deceleration on a vehicle through other IoT sensors, suddenly the video is the metadata about the event. So I think it's important that we all step back a little bit and imagine that the world is a little bit different in terms of its organization of the data once you introduce real-time data from IoT and from AI processes and cameras. The camera sees the violence event. Uh, the video artifact doesn't. So the video artifact, or in other words, a pointer to exactly that video becomes the metadata. So the video becomes the metadata. The event itself is the data. Just saying. Great. Thank you, guys. Well, in the interest of time and to be respectful of everyone's time, I think that concludes all the questions for today. Um, for any questions we did not get to, um, we'll have our speakers uh, send an email response to those uh, folks. So thank you very much, uh, John, Bill, and David. That um, was a great presentation, yeah. and we hope everyone joins us for the next webinar. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Right. Thank you.